As we get into the word of the Lord, why don't we do this one more time? Let's go before the Lord and just pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Let Him be our teacher. Let Him be our counselor. Today, would you bow your heads and let's just prepare. Father, we thank You that we have the opportunity to come into the house of God. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man or from a woman, from the older, from the young. Lord, we come to hear from You. And tonight, we acknowledge that it's Jesus that's the leader of this house. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask Your Holy Spirit would speak to us, lead us and guide us, direct us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to understand Your will, Your word, Your precepts for our life. As we look into the Word, Father, I think that we would take it, we would uh, hold on to it, Lord, we would apply it to our lives, and we would live the fullness of your purpose of our lives as we walk out of this place. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. We all together said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians in the fifth chapter. We're looking at statements in the Bible that talk about us in Him or us in Christ. And so we're going to look at probably one of the most profound and deep statements starting right off about who we are in Jesus Christ, a look into your identity in Christ. I want to ask you a question. I want to start off by asking a loaded question, but let's just set it off by doing it. Has has anybody in this place ever just messed up? Lord, help me. There's a few of us. I heard Danny. Danny's messed up. Praise Jesus, Danny. You and me, we have messed up. Has anybody in this place ever messed up before? You just, you just, man, you just made a mistake. You just said things you shouldn't have said. You've done things you shouldn't have done. You knew what you should have done, but you didn't do what you knew you should have done. And you just lived in the consequences and the regret and the shame and, the, and all the different things that follow right after that. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been there before? Has anybody ever been there today? Praise Jesus for His grace. Hallelujah. Listen, the truth of the matter is, look, we've all been there. We've all done things in our lives that we just, we don't live up to our own expectations. We try and we think, you know what, I'm going to make it this time, I'm going to do it this time, I'm going to, I'm going to step up and I'm going to, I'm going to leave that behind or I'm going to go to a new level, a new place in life and then what happens? But we fall on our faces and we fall short. And guilt and condemnation and all these different emotions begin to come into our lives and we begin to hold ourselves accountable. We begin to look at ourselves in a light that's unfavorable. We become disappointed with ourselves and we begin to say with our self-esteem and with our self-image, I can't do this, I'm not doing this, I'm just not good enough, I'm not right enough. I can never perform to the level or expectations that I think I should be at. Has anybody ever been there? Give me an amen, a wave, a holler, something so I know that you're there. You know... We have a tendency to look at our performance in life as humans, as people. We look at our performance and we dictate and we judge our life's progression and we judge the place and we judge our position with God based on the performance of our lives. Just a few days ago, we had this uh, water heater at our house. Now, our water heater, just to set you up, our water heater at our house broke. It is a thankless device. There is no joy and thanks for a water heater until it breaks. And then all of a sudden you realize how cold water is, right? But then our water heater didn't really break. It just kind of like stopped working. So you'd have to kind of like old days mentality, like you'd have to get up and think like 30 minutes ahead, I want to take a shower and then go down to the garage and turn the water heater on and then wait like 30 or 45 minutes to get that lukewarm water and take a shower. Now you would think that because we are a convenience driven society that we would only go, I would only go like a couple of days with a broken heater, but you know what was it made? Like six months of just like old world, like, all right, we got to do the dishes right now, let's go turn on the water heater, wait for the water to heat up, get it, you know, go to bed at night, be like, I'm going to turn on the water heater tonight, when I wake up in the morning, it's going to be off, but the water will still be hot, praise Jesus for hot water. So finally one day, I got a day off, and I looked at my wife, and I'm like, baby, I'm going to fix that water heater. So we went out there and we bought a new water heater after I tried to replace all the different parts. And I spent just as much money in parts as I could have just by buying a new water heater. So finally we go out there and we buy a brand new water heater. We put it in. Sure enough, what do we do as soon as we plug in the water heater? Find out we bought a defective water heater. Big old label on the store on the box. Do not return to the store. So we call the people up and we're like, water heater's broken. They're like, what's wrong with it? Like, it won't stay lit. 
And they're like, you try this and try that. I'm like, you don't understand. This is the problem I have had for six months. And I just bought a brand new made in the USA. So anyways, they send us the part. They overnight us the part. So I'm like, all right, I'm in like home repair mode. So we go and in our house, there's this light that you turn it on and it turns on and then it turns off. It's like a loose connection. So I'm like, girl, I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to buy a brand new electrical socket. I'm going to take them, turn the switcher or the breaker off, plug it in because I'm Mr. Fix it at the house, get up on the ladder and do it, go and turn on the ladder, sure enough, turn on the light, boom, it's on, and then it turned off, all right, all right, moving on, so then, the same day, this is the same day, I'm like, you know what, our, our house, we have a lot of, uh, we had no water pressure, like none at all, like you turn it on, and it would just like trickle out of the sink, like hot and cold, so all the plumbers are going to be like, Pastor Luke, I can fix your problem, but here's it, so, so I'm, I googled it, I found out there's this thing outside your house called a pressure regulator, and you got to turn the knob, and it regulates the pressure from the outside to the inside and so I find the knob on my house and Bjorn's out there with me and, and I got the screwdriver and I'm like okay buddy you ready to help dad and I got the screwdriver and I'm holding it and the screwdriver slips and shh, right across my palm slits a hole uh, gets a gash right across my palm say the wonderful four letter word in front of my five year old in which the very next day he repeats it <laughs> praise Jesus and it was just like in the course of one day, everything I was doing was just like not meeting what I thought it would happen. You know, like I thought like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repair the water heater and I did some soldering. I, I, I watched it on TV. You just take a torch and you put the little thing on there and it just automatically does it. Got this massive burn on my arm. People were thinking I got a tattoo. Burn myself. I mean, the light in the kitchen is still broken. The water, the water pressure regulator is still broken broken, and it's just like, God, I just am not good enough for anything. I told my wife, I'm like, I'm so mad at myself. I'm so frustrated. I'm so beat up. It's like, no matter what I do, it's never good enough. I just want to numb the frustration. I want to go to bed and just forget about life. And you know, sometimes in life, that's kind of what happens to us in our walks with God. When we talk about discovering our identity in Jesus Christ, it's like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church and I'm going to really get involved. And we start, and we start out really good and we start out really strong. And now I know that's not any of you in this place because you're already here. But it's everybody else, somebody you know, right? And, and we say, I'm going to do that. And we start out really strong. And then what happens? Something happens and we, we mess up. We trip and fall. We stumble on something that we should never have stumbled on. We, you're like Pastor Luke and you say, well, I didn't know Pastor said four little words. It was one that started with an S, not an F. But anyways. Um, we say, the, Pastor Luke, you don't understand, I, I was doing really good, and all of a sudden, just those high school words came out again, just like you, praise Jesus for his grace. You know, you might be, you might be a, you know, been really good, been sober, or something like that, and then all of a sudden, you got around the wrong person, and all of a sudden, it's just like, boom, right back in your past, and you start, start to think of yourself, just like I did with my home improvement project. It's just like, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, no matter, no matter what effort I give, it's like, I can never measure up, I can never meet the expectations, and it's like... We begin to start to think in our, in our relationship. We begin to start to think in our identity with God. Maybe, maybe I'm just hopeless. Maybe I'm just useless. Maybe I'm just destined to be this failure in life. Maybe there's just no future. There's no hope for me. But let me tell you something. We, I think oftentimes when we look at how we are and who we are in Christ, we have the, uh, the, the formula, so to say, backwards. You see, so often in life, we judge our position by God by our performance in life. And who we are to God, we look at it as though how we perform in life. As though God is like a taskmaster principal with a checklist sheet going through each and every day of our lives saying, well, you did it, check. Well, you didn't check. Oh, you said that word. Uh -huh. And we have this idea, this, chrono, uh, this chronological uh, record of our life, every mistake and every little thing, and it's just like one little check off the mark, and it's like we look at this mark, and we look at Peter, and we look at Paul, and we look at Pastor Jim, and we say, there's no way I'll ever get to this level of expectation. Who am I, and what is the point of even trying? But you see, we need to understand our identity in Christ is not our performance, does not dictate our position in Christ, but we'll see right here in 2 Corinthians that it's really the other way around to God. 
And here Paul the Apostle is talking to the church and he's, and he's just dropping some heaviness right here in the book of Corinthians. I mean, 1 Corinthians is all about correction. I mean, it's like you guys, you church of Corinth, I can just imagine Paul is just like rubbing his forehead just like, oh my gosh, like are you guys getting what I'm saying because you're missing it, right? So then 2 Corinthians, they're talking about a guy, 2 Corinthians starts off with this other guy that they corrected and they like went super far and they're like, okay, you booted the guy out of the church and he's like, really sorry and he's really repentant, bring him back in. So now it's all kind of about, you know, laying the foundation for God's plan and unity in the body of Christ and his grace to each and every one of us. And 2 Corinthians in the five chapter, fifth chapter, we, we know a very famous verse, uh, probably one of the more famous verses in the Bible about uh, 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 us being a new creation. And I'm sure maybe even somebody will talk about that in the course of Sunday night, about in Christ we're a new creation. But at the end of this statement that Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians in the fifth chapter, in the reconciliation and bringing us back to a position with God, I want you to look at what Paul says to the church. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And he's talking about us becoming new in Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, he says these words in verse number 21. He says, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I mean, the magnitude of the statement that Paul just made right there, I think oftentimes when we read that, it's just like, right over our heads like, cool, uh, I'm so glad for Jesus, and I'm so glad that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. But we got to understand the depth and the weight and the magnitude of exactly what Paul the Apostle is saying here. He's saying here, church... We are reconciled. We are brought out from the outside to the inside with God. And he says, this is how we did it. The, we, we, you can use the, the, the terminology like this. Uh, the great exchange. What does that mean? The great exchange. Humanity's position with God was sin and shame. That's what you and I are born into. The Old Testament says there is none righteous except from God. Nobody, nobody on earth has ever been good enough to be connected with God based on what they've done. The Bible tells us in Romans, the third chapter, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, think back to your childhood. Some of you might be a long time. Some of you might just been a couple of years ago. Nobody had to teach you how to lie. Nobody had to teach you how to steal. When you were in school, nobody had to teach you how to write the answers on your palm or nowadays on your phone and pull it back up, trying to be all slick. on the. T nobody had to teach you how to do that. Why? Because it is inherent and ingrained into your not in your and my DNA. We are by nature, our position is shame and defeat. That's who we are as humans. And the great exchange is that God in His position is just and righteous and, 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 and perfect in all ways, shapes and forms. And the great exchange is that this God who is just and this God who is perfect and this God who is spotless and sinless and the Bible says God cannot even look upon sin. This great exchange, this is the God who sent His Son to live on the earth, born of a virgin, uh, who was exempt from the DNA of man so that He did not have the sin nature of humanity. And now God sent His Son, born of a virgin, to live a perfect and sinless life, to die on a cross for us, humanity, who were destined to live in sin and shame and separation from God so that God could bestow the righteousness of God on humans and the sin of humans on Christ. It's absurd. It's insane. It doesn't make any sense. But it's the great exchange. And it's the truth. You see, the magnitude of what we need to understand about our position in Christ is look what it says about Jesus Christ. It says that God made Jesus who knew no sin. Jesus was perfect in every way. It says, it made, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin. That's, that's massive. Listen, it didn't say God made Jesus who knew no sin to become like sin. 
It didn't say that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be just another sinner on earth to, to empathize with our lives. It said God made Jesus, who was perfect, who was the light of the world, the, the, the spoken and living Word of God. It was there at the creation of the earth. God said, Son, I'm going to send you to the earth, and I'm going to create upon you, and I'm going to place upon you the embodiment of all of the sin of humanity, and I will create in you, and I will make upon you and I will look upon you as sin so that humanity could have the righteousness of God through you. That is not a performance mindset. That is a positional mindset. You see, God bestowed or put upon Jesus Christ the weight of all sin so that he could bless humanity with righteousness. You see, your position in Christ is not somebody who can never get it right. Your position in Christ is not somebody who can perform to the expectations that the world puts upon you because you'll never live up to those expectations. Your position in Christ is not to live up to the expectations of what you think the, the, that, should, that should be. And because you can live up to and because today was a good day, that everything's good between you and God and everything's, everything's hunky-dory. No, your position is Christ is based, not based upon your performance and what you have done. Your position is Christ is based upon what Jesus did on the cross for you. That is who you are. Which means when God looks at you, in Jesus Christ, when you have faith in Jesus Christ through the grace, you've received salvation by faith through grace. When you look upon and you believe in Jesus Christ with your heart and with your life, God does not look at you how you look at you. You look at you in the mirror and you look at a failure. You look at you in the mirror and you look at somebody that can't live up to the expectations of the world. You look at you and you look at somebody who's ugly, who's diminished, who's washed up, who never amounted to anything. That's what you see when you see you. And we have a tendency to want to take what we see and, and relate that to what God sees. But you need to understand your position and your place in God is that when God looks at you, He sees Jesus. He sees righteousness. Listen. What Paul says, he says that you might become not just the righteousness of man. Not that you might just become the righteousness of, of humanity. Not that you might become the righteousness of, of, of Peter or of, of James or of Paul. Not that you might become the righteousness of Moses or of Abraham or of David. Not that you might become the righteousness of somebody who was a good and exemplary person. It says that he made Jesus to become the embodiment of sin for you and I. Why? So that you and I would become the righteousness of who? God in Christ Jesus. Which means to you and I, when we look at the performance of our lives, when we make mistakes, church, you are a human being. Guess what that means for you and me? You're going to make more mistakes. When you trip and when you fall, Pastor, look, I'm done with that. I ain't going to go there no more. When you walk out of this place and say, Jesus, I'm not going there anymore, and you do it again, we say, God, how could you love anybody like me? I'm a screw-up. I'm a mess-up. I can't seem to change up. But God says, listen, you need to change your perspective because you're looking at you how you think I see you. Let me tell you how I see you. I see you as the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The great exchange. And so we can't allow performance to dictate our position in Christ. That's what we call religion. Amen. Pray as many prayers as you can. Go to as many church services as you can. Carry the biggest, fattest, uh, most, most you know, traditional looking Bible you can. And still die and go to hell. Why? Because God's not interested in performance. He's interested in your position in Him before all else. He says, I want you to understand who you are so that you can understand why you are here. So when you look at yourself in the mirror... And I say not if, I say when you mess up. When you say those words you're not supposed to say, praise the Lord Jesus. My wife's over there shaking her head. 
God's not finished with me yet. You can look at yourself in the mirror and you can say what God says. Because God's not saying about you, you're a failure. God's not saying about you, you're a loser. God's not saying about you, you're washed up. God's not saying about you, you're done. God's not saying about you, you're worthless. You know what God's saying? God's saying, you are my righteousness. You are my righteousness. You are my righteousness. Now all of a sudden, righteousness being right standing with God. Now you and I are in the right standing position and place with God. Jesus understood the heart of men. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Luke in the 15th chapter. Jesus understood the heart of men and He tells this amazing parable. We know this parable. Many of you know this parable. If you're new to church, then you probably don't, but we're gonna, you're going to know it today. He tells this parable or this story, this fictional story of two sons and their father. Luke in the 15th chapter, and we're just going to read it. I want to see God's position versus our perspective of performance and what Jesus says about this. And if you've got your Bibles, Luke the 15th chapter, verse number 11. Jesus is telling a parable. And it says this, he says, he said, Jesus said, a certain man has two sons. The younger of them said to his father, give me a portion of the goods that falls to me. Give me my inheritance. So he divided to them his livelihood, everything he had. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Spent it on hookers and drugs and alcohol. He lived for the world. If you and I were to equate this today, he took his possessions and he went to Las Vegas in the matter of a couple of days, started living that whole what stays in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and now all of a sudden he finds himself to a citizen of that country, verse number 15, and he sent him, the citizen sends him into the fields to feed the swine. One of the lowest positions a man of authority, a man of stature could have had. Pigs to, to Hebrews were unclean. They weren't to be touched. They weren't to be dealt with. They were just... Nothing, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And here his job is to feed pigs, to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, the food, the leftovers, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and I'll go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me your hired servant. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, listen to this, his father saw him. And, and he was filled with compassion and he ran and he fell upon his neck and he kissed him. And the son says to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But I love what it says in Jesus' parable. But the father said to his servants, he didn't even reply to his son. Get out my best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and put sandals on his feet and bring out the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We'll check the second part of this verse out, but think about it for a moment. Here it is, the son is wrapped up in performance. He's squandered his life, he's ruined his life, and there he is, and he comes to himself and he says, I'm no longer worthy, my performance has dictated my position with my dad. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son of my father, but I will return and ask him, Lord, help me to work so that I can earn favor in your sight again. He was performance-minded, but when he got to his dad, his dad didn't even acknowledge his request. 
Instantly his dad said, get my robe, get my ring, get my sandals, get the food, invite the neighbors. We're having a party. Why? Because he's asking to be a servant. Because performance wise, he doesn't think he levels up. But the father says, this is my son who was lost, but now was found, who is dead, but is now alive. You see, God's not looking at the performance of your life. He's looking for the position of who you are in Jesus Christ. You are sons and daughters of God. And so they have a party for this, this, this man. And so his older son was in the field. And he came up and he drew near to the house and he heard music. And dancing. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know what I mean? Like the synth is going, right? DJ spinning. Right? So he called one of the servants and he asked these things, what these things meant. Man, why is dad, why is dad throwing a party? And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But look what it says. He was angry, and he wouldn't even go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, the older brother says this, Lo, these many years I have been, look at this, serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And you never even gave me a young goat that I might be merry and throw a little party with my friends and myself. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood, and with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father says to him, son, look at this, 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 get it, get it, get it, get it. Son, you are always with me. The son himself, humanity, was wrapped up in performance. He said to his dad, Dad, I have been performing all my life. I've never missed your commandments. I've never missed a day of work. I, I have lived up to your expectations. And when this sucker shows up, you elevate him back to the position that I have, look at, that I have worked for. But the father's answer was positional, not performance. And he says to both boys, you are with me. Position. God is interested in your position, your identity of who you are in Jesus Christ. You see, he looks at you and he doesn't see what you see. He sees what he sees. And we don't change what God sees, which means we need to change how we see. And we get so wrapped and so frustrated and so we beat ourselves up about the sin and the cycles of nature that we go through and the mistakes that we make in life. And we say, God, I just, I'm not worthy to be called a servant any longer or a son. Let me just come and let me, let me serve overtime in the church. Let me serve overtime and give extra of my money. Let me go to as many church services as I possibly can. And let me say as many prayers and rub as many beads or whatever it might be so that you would have favor on me again. And God says, like he says to the son, you are with me. The righteousness of God in Christ. Who you are determines what you'll do. Who you are determines what you'll do. You see the dichotomy that we still live with is that we have this battlefield in our lives of will and of conscious. We know what we should do. And we, we have this conscious of, I know this is what I need to be doing, but then we have this will in this body that we live in that says, why do I keep doing this? And yet the problem persists that every day we make mistakes and we're on this journey of life and we have rocky roads and we have uphill battles and we have downhill uh, glides where everything's going good but then all, then all of a sudden the, the, the sun is covered by clouds once again and we find ourselves in the storm of life frustrated at the performance of our lives. But I believe that you're not alone. And this battlefield of will and of conscious is not something that you deal with all by yourself and you're not an island to yourself. Even I think the great apostles in the Bible dealt with these things. As a matter of fact, if you've got your Bible, go with me to Romans. Romans in the seventh chapter. Paul. Paul is talking, and I believe Romans chapter five, Romans chapter six, and Romans chapter seven. Paul is laying out tension. 
He's writing, and, and it's like, if you, if you read Paul's writings, it's like, have you ever seen one of those grandfather clocks that have those pendulums on the bottom? He, it's like he's swinging this pendulum of law, legalism, and grace, and he's like, you're grace, you don't need the law. And, well, what does that mean? Because I've got grace, and I can live however I want. He says, no, you got to go back over here, and there's ways to live, and you can't, you can't be void of the law, but, but you got to come over here, and there's this, there's this pendulum shift from two extremes. And finally, by the seventh chapter, I believe we're at the top of the mountain of tension in Romans. When Paul the Apostle begins to lay out, I believe, now many scholars believe, and I'll let you decide this on your own, but I have come to the conclusion in my heart that Paul is talking about himself, not himself before he found Jesus. Many people believe that Romans chapter 7, Paul is speaking of Paul the Apostle before Jesus. Romans chapter 8 is Paul the Apostle after Jesus. I believe this is Paul the Apostle. And so Paul the Apostle is laying out this tension of law and of grace and of sin and of shame and, and, and of, of God's grace that covers but then the, the reality of the humanity. And by the end of the seventh chapter, Paul begins to open up to his own self and he even admits to the Corinthian church, he says, you, you say that in person I'm not really a good orator, but you say that my letters are weighty and heavy. This is one of those weighty and heavy moments that Paul is laying out and he begins to open up about himself and he says, I find that there's a problem that I live with in my life. He says, the things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And he says, the things that I know I set my heart on doing, my flesh does something else. And the things that I know I should not be doing, I do them anyways. And he, he brings this tension of grace and of law and of rules and of sin and of shame and all these different things. He brings it to the summit at Romans, the seventh chapter. And he finally says about himself, who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Just like you. When you make mistakes, just like me. When I do the things that I know I shouldn't do, when I think the things I know I shouldn't think, when I say the things I know I shouldn't say, when I eat the things, you think that's not a sin? Read your Bible. When I eat the things I know I shouldn't eat. And then afterwards, three donuts this morning for breakfast, I say to myself, <laughs> what a wretched man that I am. Just like you. Paul lived out this battlefield of conscience and will. And this, I believe, is the summit of Romans, of the tension that he has built from the first chapter of the judgment of, of the church and the second chapter of those who have, have taught and the third chapter of our, our separation from God and the fourth chapter of God's plan and the fifth chapter of God's grace and the sixth chapter of grace and sin and the seventh chapter of law. And now at the summit of the tension when it seems like it's so thick you could cut it with a knife, he resolves it by saying these words at the end of the seventh chapter, I thank God for Christ. Jesus. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, with the flesh the law of sin. My body my body is doing things that I, I just disagree with in my heart and in my mind. And then all of a sudden he transitions into an amazing statement, almost like a bipolar statement. And that's why people think that Paul was talking about pre-conversion. And Romans the 8th chapter, and they call it like this. They say Romans is the great 8. Because all of the tension that Paul has laid out is now being resolved in Romans chapter 8. And he says in verse number 1, there is now no condom. Therefore, therefore, therefore. Dad's always taught us. Therefore is there for a reason. What is therefore? Chapter 7. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus who does... For those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. But Pastor Luke, you're saying that God's not wrapped up in my performance. He's wrapped up in my position. But whenever I see the words walk in the Bible, I know that that's performance-based. Why? Because walking equals action. Action equals performance. So you can't take performance out of the, 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 the equation. 
He says there is no condemnation to those who walk according to the things of God. But look what Paul begins to say. He says it like this. Skip down a couple of verses with me. We'll leapfrog down to verse number five. For those who live performance according to the flesh. Look at this. Position. Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live performance according to the Spirit, their minds, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Is life and peace. So Pastor Luke, what do I do about this battlefield of will and conscience in my life? How do I deal with the constant struggle of the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs of the flesh body that I live in in the world that is surrounding me and has made, it as, has made it as easy and convenient as possible to sin. How do I deal with that? Reverse your perspective. You see, we always thought that our performance dictates our position with God. Reverse your perspective. Let your position with God determine and guide your performance in life. You see, who you are is what you'll do. I'm like a DIY guy. I'm always fixing stuff at home. I'm always trying to do something. And, and, and you know, they, they have this statement, you, you could be the master of a trade or the jack of all. I am the master of none but the jack of many. Which means about 80% of the way through the project, I'm finished, done, don't even care anymore. And I remember we had a home improvement project that we were working on. I couldn't get it done. It was taking way too long. So we brought somebody in who was a master. And it was like, boom. In a matter of minutes, done. Something that took me months and years to finish. In a matter of minutes, done. Why? Because who you are will determine what you do. And when you live according to the premise that, that your performance determines your position... You will never live up to the expectations that you put upon yourself. But when you look in the mirror day after day and you say, who I am is not who I think I am. Who I am is who God says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now all of a sudden, I might make a mistake, but I say, that's not who I am. Who I am is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I make a mistake again. Who I am is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I make a mistake again. Who I am is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Pastor Luke, when does it begin to change? Look what Paul says. Romans in the 8th chapter, a couple of verses back down from there now, in verse number 9. He says this to the church. He says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his in Christ. Verse number 10. And if, listen to this, if Christ, because we're talking about in Him, if Christ is in you, the body is dead. You're living in a flesh body, the battle of will. The body is leading you to death. The nature of humanity in your DNA is leading you to death. He says the body is dead, but the spirit is life. Why? Because of righteousness. Because God made Jesus Christ to become the embodiment of sin so that we could become the embodiment of righteousness in God's eyes. It says your body's dying, leading you to death, but your spirit is leading you to life. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, looks at, look at this, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You know, as a guy, as a man, I don't really get the whole pregnancy thing. Like, I remember Stacy got pregnant with Bjorn, and it was like, there's something inside of you. And as like a man, it's almost like, there's a being in you that's weird. It's just like, I get this image of like aliens, you know what I mean? Like, it's just weird. And she's growing, and there's this body, this thing inside of her. But then all of a sudden... Nine, really like 10 months. I don't know why they tell you nine just so you think it's all really good, but it's really like 10 months. Later, that baby comes out and it's life and it's love 
And everything in a moment changes. And everything that was once important is no longer important. And everything that you thought wouldn't even be important is now totally different. Why? Because your perspective in life is completely different. You see, when you and I find Jesus Christ, and we believe on Jesus in our heart, and we come to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. And the only way I can think of it is it's like we become pregnant with the Spirit of God on the inside of us. Now the dudes are like, wait a minute. It's metaphorical. We become pregnant with the Spirit of God on the inside of us, the righteousness of God that has transformed our lives, transformed our minds. What, Pastor Luke, my mind doesn't feel transformed. Why? Just like with pregnancy, it starts and it begins to grow and it begins to grow. You start to say, man, something's going on with me and I can't figure out what it is. There's something different and uh, it starts to show signs of change and start to show something, something's beginning to happen and then all of a sudden it's like people are like, what's going on? You're glowing. It's because I'm in my second trimester and, 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 <laughs> And then all of a sudden, what God has planted on the inside of you, His Spirit is birthed out of you. And now, like the Bible says, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why? Because it's not about your performance that gains your position with God. It's your position with God that as the Spirit of God begins to bring life to your body that is dead, all of a sudden this war, this battle, all of a sudden things begin to change and the Spirit of God begins to birth something on the inside of you and then all of a sudden the things that you were dealing with, you're no longer dealing with any longer. Why? Because your position is guiding your performance with Jesus Christ. Now all of a sudden, your position is beginning to tell you you don't need to hang out at the bar with those people. You don't need to gossip like you gossip. You don't need to drink like you drink. You don't need to smoke like you smoke. You don't need to talk like you talk. You don't need to look at the computer right now. You don't need to, to, to do whatever. You don't need. Why? Because your position is beginning to guide your performance. And all of a sudden, your performance is, is a reflection of your position in God. And now you are living the will and the plan of God for your life, no longer beating yourself up because you understand who you are. You are not a sinner. You are not a loser. You are not a wash up. You are not somebody who's finished. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God made Jesus to be sin so that you could be righteous in him. When you look at yourself, say what God says about you, that I am righteous in Jesus name and let the discovery of your identity be the reality of who you are to fulfill the purpose of your life here on earth to let the position of who you are in Christ guide the performance of your life and as the spirit of God brings life to your mortal body you take one step at a time one day at a time stepping out in faith and your performance the things that you've been worrying about, meeting those expectations, that stuff all goes to the side because all of a sudden my expectations are I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And I might make mistakes and I might mess up and I might foul up and I might say things, but let me tell you something. When God sees me, He doesn't see my sin. Why? Because He put my sin on Jesus. When God sees me, He sees Jesus because of the great exchange of who we are in Christ Jesus. Stop. Stop allowing your performance to dictate your position with God because you will never live up to those expectations. But allow who you are to dictate what you do in life. And understand, listen, we're human. God understands humanity. He sent Jesus Christ to be a human and put all of sin. You think you've sinned? How about all of the sin of humanity? On his son Jesus. God knows humanity. He's not surprised. He's not shocked. Just like the prodigal son, he says, come home. Come home. Come back with your hand held high. Because you are my son. You are my daughter. And I love you. And you are my righteousness because of what Jesus Christ did. Your position, church. Talking about him. In him. Your position is based upon what Jesus Christ did on that cross. That is who you are. Let your position of what Jesus did guide the performance of your life and everything else will begin to fall into place.
Did you guys get something out of God's word tonight? Part one of In Him. Listen, before we leave, let's do this. Let's talk about your position. There are those of you in this place today that despite your church attendance, despite your well-being, despite your performance, your position with God is not in the right place. But that doesn't have to be the final answer of your life. That doesn't have to be the final destiny of who you are. See, in just a moment, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to join with me in praying a prayer of salvation and inviting Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Because ultimately, the Bible tells us that there's only one way to God, and Jesus says it like this. He says that you must be born again. It's not about your church attendance. It's not about your performance. It's not about your mindset. It's not about how good of a person you are. It's not about the fact that you were raised in church. It's not about the fact that you were christened as a baby or confirmed as a teenager. It's not about those things. It's about giving your heart, giving your life to Jesus Christ. And today I believe that the Spirit of God, Jesus says in the book of Revelation, He says, Lo, I behold, behold, I stand at the door. And He says, I knock. He says, whoever opens the door, whoever opens the door, whoever opens the door, he says, I will come in and I will dine. I will be with them and they will be with me. You see, you've been living a life separated by sin from God. You've been living a life feeling empty and distraught. You've been feeling worthless and useless. No matter what you try to do in your life, it seems like there's a void on, and an emptiness on the inside of you that you just can't seem to fill. And, and right now, tonight, in understanding your position with Jesus Christ, Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit is there right now. Knocking on the door of your heart saying, all you got to do is open it up. Let me come in and let's work on this together. You've tried it your own way long enough. Today, do it God's way. It's not some well-meaning church committee's way or anything like that. Today, let's do it God's way. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to just pop your hand up. See, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. See, I'm a man, I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge you and put it right back down. Jesus says these words, he says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. He says, but if you deny him, he'll deny you. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator or conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And right now, in this place, by the spirit of God, he's knocking on the door of your heart, saying, are you going to open up? Are you going to stop trying to live your life based on performance and start living your life based on position? The invitation is yours tonight. We're going to do something a little bit differently. I want to give you the gift of privacy. Sometimes it's really intimidating to, 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 to do something as big of a decision as giving your heart and your life to Jesus Christ with everybody watching and all eyes are on you. So today I want to ask everybody if in this place if you would just honor the person next to you and just take a moment and close your eyes and just bow your heads. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but at the same time, when we close our eyes, everything begins to fade away, and now it's you and God right now. Don't let anything else come into your mind. What is your position with God? What is your place with God? Like that prodigal son, maybe you're saying, I'm not worthy to come to God. But God is saying, come, accept my son Jesus Christ today. And I'll put the robe on you and I'll put the ring on your finger and I'll put the sandals on your feet and we'll celebrate together. But it starts by making that decision today. Where are you with God? It would be a shame, listen, to walk out of this place based on the assumption that everything's good. When we know that life is short, life is fragile, we're all one accident, we're all one incident, we're all one epidemic away from our eternal destiny with God, heaven or hell. Where do you stand with God? Today, with everybody's heads bowed and everybody's eyes closed, if that's you in this place and you say, today, Pastor Luke, I, I, I want to I ensure my position with God. I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ today. I want to I get myself in alignment with, with the position. I'm tired of, of living with performance. If that's you in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if, if, when I do, I'll smack my hands. I'm going to go bang, just like that. I want you to do something real bold. I just want you to pop your hand up. I already see hands. And if that's you, what you're doing, you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. I see hands all over the place. We'll do it together. But I see you guys. I see you. 
If that's you, you're giving your heart, you're giving your life to Jesus Christ. And right after that, what we're going to do is we're all going to pray a prayer of salvation together. You're going to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life. So if that's you in this place, I'm going to ask you, hands are already going up. There's five, six, seven, eight, nine wise people. Anybody else in this place? I don't even need to clap my hands. You just raise your hands. Ten, I see you, my friend. That's you. I see you guys over there in the back. I see that hand. I see that hand. That's 11, I think. I see you guys right over there. Don't clap. Just give this a moment. Between you and God. Say, man, I wonder if I should. The Spirit of God's speaking to you right now. I see you right here in the front. It's time for you to stop doing life your way. Start doing life God's way. I see you guys. I see you guys there in the back. All over the place. 15, 16, 17 wise people. Don't let this moment pass you by. Just a moment, we'll all stand together and pray a prayer of salvation. If that's you, you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I'm I'm a man, I'll see it. Anybody else in this place today? I see you, my man. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. There's about 17 people tonight. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this together. We're going to celebrate through this. If you raised your hand, maybe you should have raised your hand. I want you to do something. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. If you're a friend, if you need a friend, if you came with somebody, look at them and say, come on, will you go with me? Or look at somebody and say, you know, come on, I'll go with you. And I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and come meet me up at this aisle. We're going to change destinies together. You said, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. Now, every action requires, every decision requires action for anything to come of it. Today you're going to decide and act upon the decisions that you've made to give your heart and life to Jesus by inviting Him into your heart, inviting Him into your life. And we're going to equip you to follow Jesus with everything God has for you. So if you raise your hand, or maybe you should have raised your hand, in a moment we're all going to stand as we do. My buddy Ruben over here, or Joe is going to sing. Joe, you're going to sing, bro? Amen, Jesus. Praise God. Joe's going to sing a song, and as he do, if that's you, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and come meet me here at this altar, because we're going to change destinies together. So let's all stand. If that's you in this place, if you want to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you come. Wherever you're at, you come and meet me right here. Come and meet me right here. Come on, buddy. Good job. Just hang out right here. If that's you, you come. Just face me. Just face me, buddy. It's all good. All good. If that's you in this place, come on. You raise your hands in the back. If that's you guys, come on. Wherever you're at, you give your heart to Jesus, making that decision today. Come on. Come on, you can come. Lord, have your way in me. If that's you, come on. You raise your hands. Come on, you guys. Give your heart to Jesus. It's time to open the door. I live for you alone Every breath that I see Now listen, I respect you guys enough to tell you the truth. I've been for real. I've been veins popping out of my neck. I even told you I cussed. You're not going to get saved because you raise your hand in a church service. You're going to get saved because you surrender your life, your heart to Jesus Christ. So if that's you guys, if you raise your hand or you know you should have raised your hand, Joe's going to sing that song one more time. If that's you, come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Make that decision to follow Jesus today. Let's change destinies together. You guys come. We'll celebrate. We'll clap. We'll we'll cheer you on into heaven. If that's you, come on. You come. It's not too late. This is your moment today. I live for you. We're still coming. We'll wait. Come on. This is your moment. Every moment I can wait, Lord, have your way. Praise God. You guys came. You're making the very best decision that you can possibly make. You know what? You might be the biggest mess up in life. But today, performance goes out the window. Why? Because God says, I'm putting you into a position. And everything's going to change. And let me be the first person to tell you, good job. Good job. Doing a good job, making the right choices one day after the next. Good job. Here's what I want to do. I said you're going to pray a prayer. You're going to invite Jesus to come in your heart and come in your life. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's going to take you guys right over there, real private, real, just real intimate. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus to come into your heart, to come into your life.
Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some real easy literature, some real easy to read information so that you walk out of this place and you say, what do I do next? We're going to point you in the right direction on your journey with Jesus Christ. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. We want to get you connected with somebody here at the church that will teach you some things about the Word of God for just a couple of weeks to build you up in the ways of God, to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything God has for your for your life, His will, and His plans for your life. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my buddy, Pastor Joel. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a great praise in the house today.